Um, so my name is Nestor Demer. I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher at NERSC, and I'm working on porting the post software framework to Perlmutter and in particular to GPU, which led me to think about how do we port Python code to GPU efficiently. And the thing I'm going to show you today is tracks, which to give you a slight teaser right now, let us like we ported a bunch of kernels and we got things like a time 16 speed up fairly easily, which is nice. But first, how do you port Python code to GPU? What are the various approaches that are available? The easiest one is to use off the shelf kernels. Maybe you have some NumPy code, use SciPy, or you use SciPy, use QPy, something for SciPy code. If you're using Pandas and Scikit-learn, you can use Rapids. And that's going to be super easy to use because you're basically, it's plug and play. And it's perfect if there is one kernel that already does the thing you want. You want to solve a linear system, you can use an existing kernel and your problem is solved. That's very good. The problem comes when you have something more specific in mind, when you want to write something more tailored to your particular scientific problem. Then you can try to combine those. Like you can try to use QPy as you would use NumPy to build your, your application, your particular algorithm. But then you're allocate, allocating a lot more intermediate values. You have more data transfer to the GPU and the performance starts to degrade very quickly. Another idea is to use a deep learning library like PyTorch, TensorFlow, or Trax, which works great if you're doing deep learning, obviously. And they're very easy to use. They're well documented. There are thousands of users, so that's very nice. And clearly, they're doing things on GPU in Python. So something is working for them. They have most useful numerical building blocks. They have pass Fourier transform, linear algebra, random number generators, all the things we want in numerical applications. But also when you try and use them to actually do GPU computing, what you realize is they tend to have a very large overhead because they optimize for a different use case. Most of the time, the thing that's expensive for them is going to be the gradient computation during the training. So they're going to make that as cheap as they can. And if, for example, if you're using PyTorch, even if you tell PyTorch that you don't care about the gradients, it's still going to be more expensive than if you were able to cut the parts of the code that, don't, that are used for the gradient. So there, are some, there is some non-trivial overhead coming from that that is non-trivial and hard to eliminate. But maybe you know what you're doing with the GPU and you're thinking, okay, let's write a kernel in CUDA, OpenCL, IP, Cycle, something like that. It's going to be very low level, but also very fast. And then you link it into Python using something like PyOpenCL or PyCUDA. And that gives you great performance if you know what you're doing. But it's going to make it much harder to use those numerical building blocks, things like random numbers, fast way transform, linear algebra, because there are linear algebra CUDA libraries, for example, but if you need to use a linear solver inside the loop, inside the loop, inside the loop in your kernel, then you're in for a world of pain. Also, it requires a lot of, exper of expertise into high performance computing because they can make code that is, they can let you write code that is very performant, but writing code that's actually performant takes a lot of time and experience. If you don't know what shared memory is on GPU, same thing. You, you need to learn a lot of things before you start writing code that's interestingly performant. They make it harder to write correct code because you're working at a lower level. And once you've done all of that, you still need to manage to compile your code with something other than Python and link it, link it into your Python. There are ways to write your kernels direct, directly in Python. You could use number and it has low level, very CUDA-like syntax. And I'm saying low level because you come back to all of the CUDA constructs. Shell memory is there. All of them are going to be there. There are other things like Daishi. The nice thing is you're going to be in Python, so you don't have to care about compiling and linking. All of that is taken care of for you, but you're still very low level and it's still very hard to call all of those numerical building blocks we would like to be using. Things like random number generation, pass Fourier transform, and so on. So my question was, is there a way to have good GPU performance, portability, and productivity in Python? Is there a solution? And the thing I found that worked really nicely for our particular use case is JAX. So what is JAX? JAX is a Python library that lets you write code in Python and then run it on whatever hardware you have, which could be a CPU, a GPU, NVIDIA, AMD, a TPU if you're Google, or something else. It also works on specialized hardware for deep learning. And at first, it was developed by Google as a building block for their deep learning frameworks. They wanted something able to, so that they would be able to write Python and run it on GPU. But it is seeing wider application in numerical, wider use in numerical application, things like molecular dynamics, ocean simulation, computational fluid dynamics. So what does it look like? It looks a lot like NumPy. Like here we have a code sample. 
And you see we are importing something called NumPy from JAX. We are generating some random numbers. We'll come back to that later. And then we are using dot of our array and array dot t. And people who know NumPy are going to NumPy are going to recognize that this is exactly what they would write it in NumPy, except that this is going to run on GPU, which is really nice. What's happening under the hood is you have a just in time compiler. Whenever you call a JAX function, it's going to be traced. So JAX is going to look at the shape of your inputs, then the shape of the output of each computation. So you have a sum, it looks at the shape of the input, the shape of the output of the sum, and builds a computational graph like that. Once it has a computational graph, it passes it to the XLA compiler that's going to actually compile it for your current hardware. So what you have is a just-in-time compiler. Compilation happens at runtime, which has a price. Like in C++, if your code takes 15 minutes to compile, that's fine. In JAX, if it took 15 minutes to compile, your code would be 15 minutes slower. In practice, you're below one second unless you have a problem somewhere. Also, it means the input sizes must be known to the tracer. And not only the input sizes, but the sizes of every tensor inside the computation. So you cannot have the size of an intermediate result be a function of the data, which sounded very restrictive when we started. And then we realized that with padding, masking, recompiling for various sizes, you can work around that. Also, the fact that you cannot have things like dependent on the data, at least for most things, means that loops and tests are restricted. And same thing, that, that felt very restrictive when we started. And then we realized JAX is providing a bunch of functions. You can work around that. They also don't allow side effects in place modifications, and they focus on GPU optimization, meaning the, compi the JAX compiler is really good on TPUs. It's very nice on GPU, but on CPU, we found we have basically single core C++ performance, which is better than Python, but not acceptable if you're running on parameter CPU. So it depends on your use case. Given all of that, how can we actually use JAX? Because that's a long list of limitations. And then we're going to see, of, to see, is it worth it to actually use it? So I told you JAX looks a lot like NumPy. Like here you have a JAX code that's working JAX code, and that is basically NumPy code. And that's really nice because if you already know NumPy, you're 90% of the way there. And if you don't know how to write something in JAX, very often you can just search on Google how to do that in NumPy, and the answer is going to be valid JAX code, which is very useful because it jump starts you into using the library very, very quickly. Now let's look at where it diverge. I told you, you're not allowed to mutate thing. So if you had an array and you wanted to update it, add one to all of its value, you have to create a new array and you can call it like the previous one. So that way it's functionally identical to mutation. BA is pretty much the same inside your function. If you wanted to modify an index, they provide some function to deal with that. So there is an add function. You can modify it at the index that could be an array of indices. And this is going to produce a new array. There is no actual mutability happening. If you want to update something, there are, there are all the usual increment, increment operations. And something that's interesting is that JAX makes parallelism transparent, meaning if you were to write a CUDA kernel and you wanted to modify a bunch of indices and some of those indices could be identical, you need to think about, oh, or am I going to deal with synchronization? Maybe I'm going to use anatomic. In JAX, parallelism is transparent, and JAX is going to take care of that for you. This operation is going to be atomic. And if the compiler decides, oh, this might cause problems, it's going to put security safeties on top of it for you. You don't have to think about it at any point. Also, I told you the JAX code is compiled. And that's important because if you write JAX just like that, it's going to be very slow. You need to compile it in order for it to be fast. And so to compile it, you have a function called JIT. So here we have a demo function called f. And to get a compiled version of that, we call JIT on f. We get f jitted. And whenever we call f on something, it's going to trace the function by running it on a, on a shape, basically, that does not contain any data. So that is going to trigger our print. And once it is traced, it's going to be sent to the compiler. The compiled version is going to be created, to be run. And the next time we run our function and the inputs with the same size, going to detect, oh, we have already compiled for that given size, so let's reuse it. If you use, if you pass new inputs with different sizes to that function, it's going to be recompiled, so that's something you have to be aware of. But on the plus side, the compiler, knowing the size, can do some very clever things. It can detect, oh, that loop is going to be tiny. 
So we're not going to be working on paralyzing, paralyzing that one. Let's paralyze this other one. And we pass other inputs and it's like, oh, but in that case, this is the loop that's going to be the outlook. This is where we should be focusing. So it lets the compiler be very clever, which is nice. Also, I told you, you cannot depend on the value inside function. One exception to that is static values. You can tell the compiler, this value is always going to be the same. Use it when you're tracing. So here, for example, you pass a Boolean and we tell it, this is going to be static. And so you can do tests on whatever you want on that Boolean, things work, and that test is going to be LED at tracing time. And that helps the optimizer also like to take care of things, to simplify things. You can do something which, which is called donating inputs. So that's not often useful, but when it's useful, it's going to be a performance benefit, a significant performance benefit sometimes, which is by default, that function takes an input, does something, returns an output, and that output is going to be a new array. But if you know your input is never going to be reused, you can tell the compiler, I don't care about my input, feel free to reuse it, to recycle it. And then the compiler is being, going to be able to say, oh, this should be an in-place operation. Which is something that's important because here you saw we did we created a new array that updated an array. And some people might be thinking, oh, that's going to be terrible. Like we're we're using a lot of memory for nothing. If you do that inside the compile section, the compiler is going to be able to say, oh, we can do an in-place modification. Or sometimes to say, that's going to be useful to have both the previous version and the new version given what we're doing. So let's keep both versions. So the compiler has the, the leeway to be cl more clever than we are, which is nice. So we can donate inputs to deal with tests, like to actually do tests on the value of things. You have two main ways. You can call NumPy where you give it a mask or a Boolean, something to return the true case, something to return in the false case. And that's useful when the computation of both branches is fairly inexpensive, which on GPU, most computations are inexpensive. If they are actually expensive, there is a lax con function. You pass it a Boolean a function to run the true case, function to run the false case, and the inputs to give to either of those functions. And that deals with test. There is also a way to do, deal with loops. Same thing, you have some while loop and fry loop primitives. And more importantly, there are some vectorization primitives. So to give you an example, here we have a double loop on i and then g. And in the in IG of the result, we apply our, the body error function and a slice on X and Y. And if we call X map, which is a, something that's going to vectorize our code, and that function body, we can tell it, oh, on the first input, we're going to slice it like this. Second input, we slice it, we slice it like this. And the output is going to be organized like that. And it's going to take our body function and turn it into a function that can process the full block of indices at once. And that's a pattern you find surprisingly often in codes. And the more you use it, the more you see it everywhere. But the GPU really loves that because basically you're able to run your loop as a single block on the GPU. And that's very performant. And here I'm using Xmap. There is also Vmap, which is going to, which is a less powerful version of Xmap that works on a single ind index. And another thing is PMAP, which is what if you have your own parameter, you have four GPUs, where you can you can use PMAP and it's going to run in parallel on your four GPUs. So that's something that you can do in Jax. It has its own system to deal with random number generation. I'm not going to go into details, but basically they have a system to generate random numbers without having problems with states. And like all of the problems you run into when you try to scale random number generation to a large number of threads that are running in parallel. It has some support for automatic differentiation, which is where it differs from most of our deep learning frameworks. When I told you like a lot of overhead is coming just from all this infrastructure to compute the gradient. JAX does gradient computation by code transformation, meaning the overhead of uh, there is no overhead to something that does not care about the gradient because nothing is there to deal with the gradient. And when you want the gradient of a function, you can call grad on that function. And it's going to transform your code and produce something that's about as fast as an analytic solution. So you get very, very fast gradient computation and no overhead when you don't care about gradient. That's a zero cost abstraction, which is very nice. Obviously, some operation cannot be differentiated because some things cannot be done. 
And to end on the how to use drag section, there are some very simple performance tricks that are worth thinking about. One thing is compilation is cheap-ish, but still it has a price. So I recommend putting just a print in the function in your drag kernel when you're starting to use them. And your function is going to run and you see how many times is my print triggered. And if it's triggered a lot more than when you were expecting, you, you have something you should be modifying because that is going to be costly. And that's going to be a cost that is easy to miss and something that's easily fixable. Also, I told you the Jax compiler does a very good job. Like all of those restrictions above are there to make the compiler's job easier. If you talk to compiler people, they're going to tell you, it's a shame that we, we our, our programming language are all about mutation. If we are not mutating data, we could, be, we could have compilers that are so much clever. And the, the thing behind the Jax compiler is to say, okay, let's do that. Let's make our life a bit harder so that the compiler can be more clever. And so very often, you can, you're going to add like maybe two lines inside the compile section and suddenly the compiler realizes, oh, I could reuse this. I don't care that much about that. And it's going to make your code five or 10% faster, which is always something that is worth getting. And as always, when you're dealing with GPU computing, you keep you keeping the data on GPU as long as you can is very worthwhile, brings a lot of benefits. So here are some libraries that are worth looking into. You find a lot more in the awesome JAX GitHub repository. There is an MPI for JAX library that introduces MPI primitives as JAX primitives that you can use in GT section. And this is going to use your MPI um, GPU support if it is there. So that's very nice. There is something to help you test JAX code and make sure it runs similarly on CPU, GPU, GT section, or not. There are some iterative optimizer, Nshape. If you're familiar with Einstein summation, Einstein does the same thing, Einstein does the same thing, but for reshaping. And that's going to make your life much easier if you're dealing with tensor with like three, five, eight dimensions and a bunch of deep learning frameworks. So is it worth it? What we did is we took TOST, which is a fairly large Python application, about 200,000 lines of Python code that's used to Python and C++ code. That used to study the cosmic microwave background. It's made of several pipelines that are distributed with MPI. It's like it's able to use the parameter supercomputer at full capacity. And all of those pipelines are composed of C kernels that are parallelized with OpenMP. And those kernels use pretty much everything you can think of. There are some random number generators, there is some fast Fourier transformation going on, linear algebra, obviously, sparse matrices, all of the things are somewhere in there. And what we did is we took two of those pipelines, parted all of the kernels to answer the question of, is it doable given all the restrictions shown below? And is it worth it? Is it actually performant? So we parted all of these kernels first, first from C++ to NumPy, then to JAX, trying to keep the interface face identical to be able to use our unit test to make sure that our port is actually functioning the way it should be. And the things we found is first, we had a bunch of kernels that had loops on irregular intervals, of, on intervals whose size is dynamic and function of the data, which is something I told you Jax does not like. So we, did, we realized, oh, just with some padding and masking, we can work with that. We introduced a type to abstract over that and our life was nice. Then a bunch of our kernels mutate their output parameters, which is something Jax also tells you you should not be doing. So we introduced, we introduced a mutable JAX array, which is just boxing a JAX array. And whenever you mutate it, it replaces replace it with a new one. And that's a dumb abstraction, but the JIT compiler does a good job with it. So we are happy about that. And we worked a lot on reducing data movement. And that's something we're still working on because we have a pipeline abstraction and there are ways to improve on that. Doing all of this, we got a seven times reduction in lines of code. So for all of the code that is used inside these pipelines, our code is now seven times shorter going from the C++ Python version to the JAX version. And if you look at those, so those are all of the kernels that have been ported. And if you look there, you're going to tell me, okay, none of those bar is seven times shorter. Some of them may be five times, but nothing is seven times shorter. That's because a lot of the reduction was not in the actual kernels, but in the utility functions. Since we're using JAX, which gives us access to NumPy, SciPy, and a bunch of other things, we don't have to write our own binding to them, Kyle. We don't have to write things like how to normalize a vector, all of those things. 
So that was a lot of reinventing the wheel that was cut out of the code. And overall, the code reduction means that the code is much easier to keep in your head, which is a nice thing. Was it worth it? So here we have a bunch of timing for various kernels. The first two lines are the time it took to move data to GPU and back to GPU and finalize is also a little bit of cleanup. That's why it's not zero for OpenMP. And we're comparing so OpenMP C++ kernels that have been optimized. They run on four threads, which for our particular problems is the fastest we can go if we had more threads, bad things happen. And Jack's running on one GPU. And those kernels are slower in Jax. And that's because those kernels spend their time getting their data and sending it back to and from GPU. But something we are working on and that's going to be fixed in hopefully one week. Those kernels are nicer. And here we have a time 16 speed up. And in the first version of this slide, we had a time 62 speed up for that kernel, the North Wade kernel. And that was such a good speed up. We went to look at the code thinking, okay, there is a problem somewhere that's not normal. And we found the problem. We had a performance bug in our C++ code. We had a critical section inside the parallel loop that was making the code slower than sequential. We fixed it, and no things are much better in the C++ code. And that illustrates something that's interesting with JAX, which is parallelism is transparent in JAX. You don't have to think about parallelism, meaning you cannot introduce performance bugs by making mistakes in the way you parallelize your code. And that's really useful for people who are primarily domain experts, who know their science, they know their cosmology, but writing high performance code is not their main field of study. So this is a proof of concept. You have ported a bunch of kernels, two pipelines. It's a work in progress. But we found that's doable, which is very nice. And that's worth doing because the code is easier to understand, shorter, and faster. What we could do to go faster, to go faster, to go further is to reduce data movement. That's a work that's going on. We have still a lot of data movement that is avoidable. We could reduce the number of C++ dependency. Like there, there is no reason to keep a code base that is a mix of C++ and Python if you can have full Python and the same or better performances. Also, a lot of our code complexity comes from the fact that the, we're trying to preserve the interface of the C++ kernels. But we could also default to JAX arrays, to pure functions, and then our code will be significantly simpler. And we could, and if we did all of that, we could redesign our pipeline to JIT them as JIT our series of kernel into a single huge GPU kernel on the fly. And that will bring, we expect, lots of performance benefits. So should you use should you use JAX in your projects? I think JAX will be interesting for you if first your code has to be in Python. Obviously, if you're using Julia, there are some things, but you probably will not want to use JAX or the back end of the JAX compiler. Your code should be written in NumPy, which is most likely what you're doing if you have a Python code, and should be readable in a NumPy style. Your array sizes should not be too dynamic. We thought that would be a big problem. That has not been a blocker for us so far. And the JAX team is working on reducing those limitations, but still, I'm sure there are some codes that are way too dynamic for the JAX programming model at the moment. And also single-threaded single C++ performance should be an acceptable fallback in the absence of GPU. If you know that your code will sometimes run on CPU and not on GPU, and you need, you need multi-core performance, then JAX is not going to be a good. And the flip side, I think JAX is really nice, is at a, a sweet spot in the design Pareto front for people who are doing research and complex numerical code, because it lets you write code that is easier to make correct, fast, and that very quickly. So you're being very productive. Because it lets you focus on the semantic of the code and it separates neatly between the semantic of the code, which is the thing you're dealing with as a domain expert, and the optimization, which is led to the compiler. And you had all of those restrictions to let the compiler be as clever as it can be. That way, you never think about optimization. Also, it lets you have a single code base to deal with both CPU and GPU code. And that's really nice because you can test your code in your GitHub CI and then run it on, on GPU on parameter. And that's going to be the same code and behave in the same way. That's very practical. Also, the immutable design limitation are actually very nice for correctness. What we found is after having part, parts of the code, we found bugs in the C++ part of the code, but we are not present in the JAX part because it was immutable, so we were not allowed to do some things that would have introduced those bugs. And it makes it really, really easy to use numerical building blocks because you're using the things you're used to be using in Python, like NumPy and SciPy. 
And so if you need to solve a linear system inside the loop, inside the loop, inside the loop, inside your kernel, which is a real thing I did like two weeks ago, you can do it. That's going to be very easy. And that is very practical, very empowering. So thank you. And for people who are interested in JAX, you can follow that link. I also put a link in the Slack channel to have a bunch of exercises that are on Google Collab, and they're going to work you through putting some simple Python codes to JAX to get a feel for it and whether that's a programming model you're interested in or not. Uh, 